Nanook of the North, Grey Gardens, Burden of Dreams, The Sorrow and the Pity, Paris is Burning, F is for Fake, The Thin Blue Line, and Last Night in Sweden. One man's terrifying journey into the dark heart of an immigrant induced crime ridden murder infested rape rodeo nightmare the horrors he endured would be etched on his soul for eternity so we're walking around Rosengard it's uh kind of boring this really is considered to be, you know, the poorest or worst place in Sweden. Wow. And Sweden's doing Sweden's doing pretty well. It's snowing. It's snowing a lot. You know, I don't know what you'd expect to happen here. It's just a neighborhood. There's a lot of people who think that, you know, you'll get robbed here, that there's a lot of sex crimes or anything like that. You, you know, that's not the case. No, 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 no. They said that we'd get robbed if we came out here. No. You know what the most dangerous part about this is, Tim? What? The ice on the ground. There it is, yeah. They don't salt. Wow, that is just some really riveting stuff right there. And hey, it's Vadim. And today, guys, we're going to talk a little bit more about Tim Pool's feature length documentary, Last Night in Sweden, which tragically, much like Stanley Kubrick's Napoleon, Alejandro Jodorowsky's Dune, and Tommy Wiseau's Glengarry Glenn Ross, never saw the light of day. Yes, Tim's original intent was to produce a documentary according to his Kickstarter initial fundraising video. And gee, I just can't imagine why it never came to light. I mean, he uncovered so many shocking revelations about immigrants crime in Sweden. Have you seen robberies or gangs? No, not at all. I mean, there was one 14 year old that that went, that, that had like a pretty loud cracker, you know, a firecracker? Firecracker. <laughs> yeah. Firecrackers, which of course are extremely deadly, as the rash of ISIS ass firecrackerings of 2017 certainly taught us. Black man! Well, first of all, in the last video, which incidentally drew some unexpected praise from former co-workers and associates of Pool. That was interesting. So yeah, in that video, I promised you scandalous, never before seen footage that Tim Pool does not want you to see. And to be perfectly honest, that was a bit of a white lie. Ow, oh, fuck, that was, was that really necessary? Um, anyhow, uh, well, actually, those were just highly embarrassing, long since deleted videos. But today, I have actual unreleased footage for reals, as well as unaltered footage from his trip to Sweden that has never seen the light of the internet. I definitely think I know why. And by the way, you can't do a thing about it, Tim, because... He had never signed a contract. So yeah, we're gonna talk about all that. Uh, several not very surprising, but in my opinion, highly unethical things that occurred behind the scenes within the series that until now have gone completely unknown. How these videos, which if you don't know, are what truly launched his solo YouTube career as a journalist. I mean, the sudden jump in views kind of speaks for itself. Anyhow, we're gonna talk about how this series of videos was kind of hijacked by one of the most right-wing journalists in all of Sweden, and how the broadcast of just one unseen interview could have completely dismantled not just the fear of porn that Tim was desperately trying to inject into these videos, but what continue to be some of Tim's major talking points to this day. So I just don't know if I can emphasize enough that all this isn't just important because it sheds light on unknown egregious lies and examples of pool practicing ethically bankrupt doo-doo journalism, but but it's literally the ethically bankrupt doo-doo journalism that jump-started his career. So, why was Last Night in Sweden never made? But, uh, you know, I don't know what you'd expect to happen here. There's just a bunch of people walking around with some old people shopping. You know, if I were to compare this to Chicago, I would laugh. It was boring. Oh my 
God, I hated watching it. It was also boring from the standpoint of drumming up anti-immigrant hysteria, so much so that Paul Joseph Watson had to just straight up make lies up about it like this. There was a Lebanese shopkeeper in Malmo who is an immigrant himself. He wants to move back to Lebanon. Do you ever plan on going back to Lebanon? To live there? Yeah. No. Sweden is just better or what? Yeah, much better. It's the best country. But fortunately for Tim, he did manage to have just one incident that was still, in my opinion, excruciatingly boring, yet somehow aided right-wing media outlets like the Daily Wire in making claims like, But it turns out Sweden really has become a stinking cesspool of f***ing violence. And that was Tim's video, Getting Escorted Out of Rinkaby. Let's take a look, shall we? Uh, the police have just warned us that if, if we don't leave now and, and take this escort, it's going to get really bad really fast. They said 50 people could be here in minutes and they recognize us. They're masking up. We have to leave. So local police did, in fact, go on to dispute Tim's claims of the event. And until now, I thought that the truth of what happened that day would forever be between Tim, the local police and Sinu. But as it turns out, I have new behind the scenes facts to shed on this event. So now I think it's time that we dig a little deeper. Some uh, quick updates as my premium patrons roll across the screen. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I didn't realize that cow was also an incendiary device. Ah, uh, I feel bad. Um, but anyhow, although this is technically a sequel to Tim Pool Apocalypse, The Lost Tim Pool Tapes, this video can very much be enjoyed independently. The only info that I think we should reestablish is that Tim passed off an Alex Jones level batshit fringe political group with neo-Nazi ties in his Sweden series as just regular Swedish dudes concerned with immigration. I'm not exaggerating, it's actually far worse than it sounds. I also mentioned a study by the Institute of Global Affairs that shows how his videos aided a coordinated smear campaign led by the Swedish far right. And I've since found an essay from the respected Brookings Institute, which cites Tim's videos specifically as materials that help Swedish far right populist right wing groups spread their rhetoric internationally. So keep that all in mind, because although sure, while this video can be viewed as some sort of big Tim Pool dunk, what we're really looking at here is both the false narratives that people like Tim establish in order to spread harmful far right wing messaging, as well as the dishonest lengths they go to in order to achieve. It. So, back to Rikabi. Tim's initial claims that you heard earlier both changed and escalated rather quickly, changing the story he told here in four key ways and making the event sound far more threatening than it initially was. And here are those differences. But in Stockholm and Rikabi, they, they immediately start yelling at us. That while receiving the escort, as we were walking, there were people following us, yelling things. Oh, and finally, that police had said that irate flash mob of 50 mass people who were presumably sprinting there at an astonishing speed weren't empty handed. Well, I'll let Tim explain. And the cop says, well, you know, look, maybe if we arrest one person, there'll be 50, 50 more people here with stones. So now they were going to be armed with stones. Our CGI team whipped up this little recreation that thankfully never occurred. <laughs> Now, Tim's upload of this footage at a certain point just fast forwards and you can't hear or see really anything that's going on, but I happen to have the unedited version and well, the footage just does not line up with what he's saying. And here's something to keep in mind. Due to Tim's fast forwarding, you can tell, but he actually attempts to summarize what had just occurred three more times. We can't play all of them, but here's one. We have to get a police escort right now. We've been warned by them that uh, it could get really dangerous if we don't leave right now from Rinkaby. 
a total of four, and you'd think he'd mention just one of the four of these things at least once, as they would be important details, but he doesn't. And again, to be crystal clear, it's primarily these elements of Tim's story that alternative right-wing media sites both highlighted and sensationalized, which in turn massively raised both Tim's profile and that of the series. So it's extremely important that we just really drill down on these key points. So claim number one, they were being followed. Watching this at normal speed, I'm just not seeing anyone following him. I don't think he's in mortal danger at any point whatsoever. Although there was this one point earlier. Barring that, I've watched this several times and the closest thing to anyone following him is this woman with the baby stroller right here. But to be perfectly fair, she does pop in here again later. Maybe Tim thought that she was in hot pursuit. That's terrifying. Who knows? Maybe he was paranoid that she was going to do this. But I'd say that the chances of that are relatively slim. So we'll call that claim debunked. Claim number two, people were shouting things. So I've listened to this several times over and the closest thing that I could hear to anyone yelling anything at Tim is this. I am now, I can see how that might be terrifying. I mean, she's speaking a foreign language. For all he knows, she could be saying, I'm gonna take a buzz saw to your forehead and drink out of your skull like a goblet. But there's literally nothing else. I did take the liberty of hiring a dog with ultra sensitive hearing. Uh, unfortunately, he just sat around with an erection and due to YouTube's terms of service, I can't show it. But I did ask that erection if he had heard anything. Yeah, honestly, I didn't hear anything. Thanks, penis. So there's absolutely no doubt about it. Tim was just lying about this. Debunked. Claim number three, they were immediately shouting at him when they arrived. So I will admit there is no shortage of shady looking characters inside this sunlit outdoor shopping mall. Now there's no footage to corroborate this. It's possible that it did happen off camera, except I did speak with the segment's camera woman and she recalls that literally only one thing was shouted, which was, who are you with? And she said it was difficult to even decipher whether that was meant in a threatening tone at all. So yeah, that's kinda debunked. And finally, claim number four, Tim's totally credible sounding claim that the police believe that at any second, you know, maybe if we arrest one of these guys, there will be, there could be 50 more in a few minutes with stones. Sure, why not? I mean, if a horde of 50 mass irate refugees were suddenly going to appear, I guess presumably from their stronghold beneath this outdoor shopping mall, why wouldn't they first grab a stone from their stockpile of rocks? Yeah, super duper believable. Uh, look, we don't have much to go on here. It's not fully debunkable, but I did speak to a few people in law enforcement and no, this isn't like the dog penis thing. I actually did talk with them and their reaction to Tim's claim was basically, oof, cringe, hard cringe. Yeah, they don't buy it. Cause bottom line, if the police think that you are literally at risk of 50 irate townspeople, I don't know, stoning you to death? Or more specifically, if they genuinely think that you are in threat of death or great bodily harm, they and their department are accountable for any harm that befalls you. And that includes this. The procedure in that situation is they would accompany you far more closely than they did here, at least write an information report or get an incident number, they didn't, and make sure that you have gotten to your car on foot and follow you out of the area. None of these things happened. Now, full disclosure, Tim's associate did say that the police recommended that they stop filming and leave. Uh, probably because not everybody likes to be filmed? But Tim asked for the escort himself. He's said so numerous times. The officer said, if we make an arrest, there could be 50 people here with stones. And so mm -hmm. uh, I asked them, will, are, will you follow us out? And well, I don't doubt that they gave him some kind of extremely informal escort towards his vehicle. But the idea that they genuinely believed he was in grave danger, which Tim definitely wants you to believe. And 
lock the doors and let's get the hell out of here. It's just not at all supported by the video and the total lack of standard procedure that's evident within it. And for the record, the police remarked that this happened to be their typical route. Tim was going in the same direction and this is where they normally park. All this was in fact confirmed by a Danish reporter who was living in the area at the time. In the four days I've been in Rinkeby, I've seen the police drive the same route around the city all day long. That's the route Tim Paul happens to be taking. His car is parked at the local school, where police are driving over next door and parking, just like they usually do. It has nothing to do with Tim Paul. And finally, I just have to mention this Swedish article that I came across that really made things fall into place for me. Tim is, I guess, a war reporter? a war reporter. He's discussed things like nearly being killed in Venezuela and many other supposedly deadly situations many times. Yet when Tim reaches his car and it doesn't start, this is his immediate reaction. Wait, the car is not starting. Did they disable your car? Yeah. No, it is. Okay, we really need to unpack that reaction because I think it's incredibly telling. And you know what, let's steel man all of this. Let's say for the sake of the argument that this angry mob with stones in hand did in fact exist. Masked men were following him, shouting crazy things, all of it, okay? For this moment to be anything but pure theatrics, we still have to believe that Tim actually thought that they somehow identified his car, which was parked well over a tenth of a mile away. I Google earthed and Google mapped this shit, so I know what I'm talking about. Uh, that cracked out looking thing, that's the police car. This area right here is where Tim walked through with those crazy quasi-Nazi dudes and then crossed all the way from here to here to here, crossed through this intersection. At this point, we passed well over 200 meters. That's nearly a 13th of a mile. He then continued at least another 25 meters into the parking lot. See that? That is the D1 building. And if we zoom out, I presume that these are the refugees. Patiently laying in wait and ready to ambush him at any moment because they psychically knew the model of his car and sabotaged it so that it wouldn't start. Did they disable your car? Yeah, all sounds totally legit, doesn't it? Uh, but please remember folks, this entire set of lies that we have painstakingly gone through, they didn't just enable far right wing outlets to make a case that Sweden is a stinking cesspool of violence and like rape a or whatever. In the eyes of his fans, that all made him look heroic. And I want you to take a mental note of that because we're gonna circle back to that later. And Cortez, you're totally making me lose my concentration. Never mind, end of part one. But I don't know what to do with those tossed salads and scrambled eggs. They're calling again. Do you think uh, you think that the politicians here are aware that they're making the weapons, which is creating the refugees? Yeah. Are yeah. They, are yeah. They the politician is working for the uh, for factories, the, it's an the weapon factory. First of all, you sell these weapons yeah. for these countries. You make these wars down there. You get the resources from the country. You use the people to come here as a cheap working class people. And everything about is, is about harvesting. It's really complex. What, what some of the activists down there told me is that, the, and this is more of a conspiracy, but just to give the perspective of yeah. the hard left in, in Sweden, and they're really left because they're Sweden's already left. Right. Uh, is that Sweden builds weapons? They then sell them, you know, to NATO, to other countries, to dictators, and then the United States, NATO, we we bomb these countries and destroy their 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 communities, and then Sweden welcomes in the refugees as sort of a surplus of that war, like a, a reward. Mm -hmm. You bring these people in, and they will bolster your economy by creating a, a cheap workforce. That's what they believe. Right. And the, uh, even though what you're saying is there's, there's really not a lot of evidence for that. Of course not, right. so it's a conspiracy. Yeah. yeah. So, 
Tim Pool just really dropping some high level batshit extremist group conspiracy level ideas there on Ruben Report. But by the way, while researching this video, I learned some interesting things. For instance, surprisingly, Tim's Sweden series was far from the most awkward and transparently racist expose on the topic. That award goes to Mr. Joey Salads. There's explosions going on, migrants running, the, roaming the streets, you know, people, and, and hopefully I don't get killed. Such a brave man. But one of the most surprising things I learned is that this series could have been good. Or, um, actually, scratch that, uh, marginally better. There were unaired interviews, like with this woman, an education administrator from the U.S. living in Sweden, who offered an overall positive view of immigration from an American perspective, Jonathan Lehman, an extremist group expert and journalist with Expo, a highly respected media watchdog group, sort of like the Swedish version of Right Wing Watch, and, oh, we're gonna talk about him later. And on top of that, there were numerous interviewees that would later go on to basically say, I'm out of here, as Tim's real agenda became obvious and they wanted no part of it. Tim's camera woman, Emily Molly, shared with me that she thought the series was going to be far more nuanced. She was kind of pissed at the direction it took. She didn't realize it would soon become the anti-immigrant slash Islam propaganda tool that it did, and that by the end, Tim was literally canceling interviews altogether with subjects that would have subdued that far-right propaganda angle significantly, mostly for interviews with extreme right-wing nutbags. And so, how did all that happen? Well, in great part, it was due to this man, a Swedish journalist by the name of Chang Frick. Now, Chang is the editor for Neater Edog. It specializes in anti-Islamic and anti-immigrant fear porn. And as I mentioned in my previous pool video, it was named in a 2018 Oxford study as one of the top three sources of fake news or junk news, as they call it in Sweden. Did I mention he was the guy at Rinkaby? Wait, the car is not started. Hmm, that's not a red flag at all. But uh, the day before the Rinkaby incident, he discussed with Tim how nearly every Every night he came across burning vehicles in Stockholm. How often do you see a car set on fire in Stockholm? Uh, if, if I just go night crawling, I would say almost every day. But then he had a pretty hard time finding many good ones when pressed for it. This was the shittiest, weakest excuse for a car fire. This is just a shitty excuse for a car fire. Here is another lousy excuse of a car fire. To his credit, he did finally find one that he and Tim agreed did not suck. Only one, though. But who is Chang Frick? Uh, aside from a guy who I think kind of looks like an Amish version of Nick Cave, well, years ago, he was an active member of the Sweden Democrats, a party with neo-Nazi tendencies. Neo-Nazi tendencies? Okay, Tim, uh, that's actually odd wording on my part. I meant to say neo-Nazi ties, but really more like absurdly thick, unbreakable Nazi chains. And this is not disputed, by the way. The Sweden Democrats were started by people who had Nazi background. Yeah, I, I, I must say I'm very, I haven't read up on, on the history completely. I've heard a lot of stories. I've, I've come from now. both. The claim is that the party that you're a member of was started by Nazis. Mm -hmm. I do a bit of reading. Articles That's true though, isn't it? Yeah, there were members of, of uh, from a Nazi background who were part of the, starting the, the party, absolutely. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, that guy was being pretty charitable in a myriad of ways. The party was actually started in 1988, in large part by this man. Here he is back in the day with his homies. The first chairman was this man, who incidentally was in a band called Commit Suicide? Yes, that, that is how it's spelled, with Ace of Bass singer Olaf Ekbert. Their songs discuss shooting immigrants and sawing off the heads of oh. Okay, you get the idea, highly normal stuff, and sorry to ruin Ace of Base forever for you if they didn't already do that themselves. Uh, that was just far too weird not to include. Anyhow, the party quickly gained ground with the fasci side of the skinhead movement in Sweden, but by 2010, and by the way, that's Chang celebrating the party's electoral victories that same year, the Sweden Dems had claimed that they had purged themselves of that element. Now, is that true? 
Um, no, of course not. There have been tons of incidents ranging from various low and high ranking officials making statements like this and doing stuff like this crap right here. And yes, it's all going by way too fast for you to read because I have like 10 times this many in a very cursed folder. Freeze them and read if you want. They're horrible. And I'm not even willing to post censored versions of a great deal of them because trust me, it's gross. But just for the memes though, I will mention that this white nationalist uber dork, we, the Northern Brothers, we have come to defend what our ancestors have left for us had a mild scandal when it was found out that he was involved in a bodybuilding group with infamous alt writer The Golden One. That sounds glorious as fuck. Who were all getting super jacked to fight an impending war against the anti-whites. And uh, this is a video that exists, by the way. no shortage of stories just like these of, you know, Nazis doing Nazi stuff. They say that they have a zero tolerance policy, but that's a total joke. They kick a bunch out, more come in. It's kind of like an unending game of whack-a-mole or whack-a-Nazi. So I guess now is as good a time as any to let you know that in an unaired segment, Tim actually joined Frick to interview the Swedish Dems, and for all intents and purposes, it turned into a shameless PR stunt for the party and an epic dumpster fire of feckless hack journalism. But before we dumpster fire dive into that, more background is needed on the Swedish Dems and Mr. Frick. So, many of the most vile SD members never get penalized for their actions at all. Like for instance in 2012 when a Sweden Dem by the name of Ken Ekeroth was involved in an incident known as the Iron Pipe Scandal where he drunkenly chased a Middle Eastern comedian with scaffolding poles while shouting a string of the most horrible slurs your imagination could possibly devise and he continued nonetheless to serve until 2018, all the while publishing numerous articles with titles like this on his blog. And coincidentally, this is the same man who registered the domain name of Chang Frick's website, Neater Edog. And it was later revealed that Chang had secretly received funding from the party and had private discussions with the Swedish Dems promising to give the party overall favorable coverage and not say anything damaging. Although Chang claims the payment isn't related. So I've thrown this term around a great deal during this segment, but I think it's an important distinction to make that for the most part, the party has shifted its early emphasis of anti-Semitism to anti-immigration and Muslims. And case in point is this actual campaign commercial from the party. Nu har du ett val. Den 19 september kan du välja invandringsbroms före pensionsbroms. Rösta på Sverigedemokraterna. Holy crap! I just, I did not know that you could do that. I did not know that you could be that transparently super crazy racist in a campaign commercial, but I, I guess I'm just naive. So the man who has been at the heart of this party for well over a decade, and also the subject of a shameless softball interview by Chang and Dim, is this man, Jimmy Ackeson. And here are a few choice quotes from him. Islam is the Nazism and communism of our time and must be approached with the same disgust and stronger resistance. And also, Islam is the biggest danger in Europe and it's going to kill us all. So that brings us back to Tim, who originally was supposed to spend just a half a day with Chang. That turned into two days, and during that time, Chang threw together this unaired last minute meeting with the Swedish Dems, featuring an interview with Akison. Now, the fact that this ever happened in the first place is like trying to find secret messages in your soup level crazy. Tim literally didn't do anything. He headed the entire interview over to Chang. It's all in Swedish. It was never translated to Tim, so he could at least ask 
ask follow-up questions. Do you guys get why that's really weird and horrible? You don't hand your journalism over to some other guy to do, especially this particular guy in this particular situation. And according to Emily Molly, he didn't even so much as hand a single question over for Chang to ask before the interview started either. Perhaps asking him why he joined the party while it was still primarily run by Nazis and lied about it would have been a good place to start, but that would have required the most basic research on Tim's part, research that I still don't think he's done. The Sweden Democrats, which they call far right, you know, right. Nazis or whatever, yeah, yeah. I don't know very much about. I think they're, I, I don't know a whole lot about what's going on. He definitely didn't do any on Chang Frick, hadn't learned that he had once held office for the Sweden Dems, or that he was asked to start Dieter Edog by Ken Eckeroth, or that he had worked for yet another news site I didn't even tell you about, which, yes, was also funded by Eckeroth while he held office, contrary to previous statements from the Sweden Dems. According to Tim, these were just facts that he didn't know. All this information was a quick Google search away, but in Tim's defense, that would have required him to do, you know, the most elementary level of journalism a human being has ever performed. So we could let him go on that one. Now, I did have it translated, so you might be wondering what horrifically racist and outrageously Islamophobic stuff was said in this meeting. Well, the answer is nothing. But that was the point. This was a product that was calculated to be harmless and easily digestible to an American audience. Propaganda. It didn't have to be. If he did something, anything, maybe one semi-tough question like, hmm, hey, why do you guys refer to Muslims as invaders in your fucking campaign commercials? But no, Tim just sat back while this shady journalist, whose job it basically was to create propaganda for the party, played him like a useful idiot and used his channel to create propaganda for the party. This entire situation reaches such a complex level of embarrassing stupidity that it almost horseshoes into being brilliant. Chang did everything. He read the entire show. I tend not to use this word a lot because I'm not that crazy about it, but there's just no way around it. Tim was nothing short of journalistically cocked here. I don't know how else to describe it. Not long after this, Tim would go on to interview this man, Ola Sandstig, about alternative media, a man who Chang would go on to publish this book with the following year. His next video after that would be his interview with the Holocaust denying extremist conspiracy theory dorks whose ideas he later echoed on the Rubin Report. Considering that Chang clearly did all the work and pulled all the strings to make this happen, who knows? Is it really that crazy to think he might have been responsible for one or both of those interviews as well? I mean... Even though what you're saying is there's, there's really not a lot of evidence for that. Of course not, right. so it's a conspiracy. Yeah. 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 So the very same day Tim's embarrassingly uneventful Rinkaby incident occurred, which of course was somehow spun by right-wing and extremist media into a harrowing brush with death, Tim shot an unaired interview with this man, Jonathan Lehman, which according to my sources, he had to be practically dragged to in order to conduct. And that's not really hard to believe, considering how super duper psyched and totally engaged him appears throughout it. Now, honestly, I could devote an entire video to this conversation. Lehman, again, is a hate group and extremism expert who really knows his shit. And it's just kind of a thing of beauty to see him one by one, both deconstruct and politely tear apart narratives that Tim has been weaving throughout not just his Sweden series, but throughout his entire career. So some stray observations before before we really dive into things. Tim makes an aside right here. The people who are watching are conservative are gonna accuse me of mm. being biased by interviewing you. Yeah, I suppose. Kudos to Tim, he dodged a major bullet there, you know, by um, not posting it at all. Also, interestingly enough, Tim refers to noted journalists, Paul Joseph Watson, correctly here. I'm here because one of, you know, a yeah. pundit, a far right pundit put up a challenge 
And I find that notable because, well, follow me here. The term far right is basically synonymous with extremism. And Paul and Tim actually complained about this happening. I said that Paul Joseph Watson is a right wing Trump supporter. But in the translations, they added the word extremist in the subtitles. <laughs> So they basically, they put up the word extremist after you describe me as right wing. That was completely fraudulent. So either Tim said the quiet part out loud there, or he needs to brush up on his political descriptors. Hopefully Paul can take that up with Tim in the near future when he's not tweeting beans on toast to own the libs. And finally, in this segment, where Lehman discusses the exceptionally anti-Semitic Holocaust-denying figure Ingrid Karlquist. Ingrid Karlquist, they dropped her because of her cooperation with, with Nazis. And uh, the Nazis are very proud of having sort of turned her. And then Tim lets this slip. We've had a ton of people telling us to meet her, to interview her. Yeah. Hmm. Tons. Uh, you know, I think that might say a lot about who was probably influencing Tim while he was out there. Makes sense, cause, um, yeah, she's a fan. Anyhow, for brevity's sake, there's a great deal that we can't review, but let's explore a few of the juicier topics that they discussed. So, Tim starts out this interview with this extremely loaded question. There's many right-wing groups, the Trump supporters, saying that refugees, that immigrants, are creating this crime wave. Is that true? Is there some kind of immigrant crime wave happening in Sweden? This debate about Sweden, I would say, is it's a bit like the 9-11 truth movement and things like this, the myths about 9-11. That's been exported to the rest of the world. And I would say this description of Sweden as a war zone, that's an export from the Swedish far right. John is, of course, undeniably 100% correct there, and I really wanted to point this out because Tim clearly played a part in packaging and exporting this myth of the Swedish far right. I'd like to remind you again of the Brookings Institute essay citing Tim for doing so, the Institute of Global Affairs study as well, which cites far right actors like Paul Joseph Watson specifically, and sort of kind of Tim as well. And finally, I'd like to say that I don't really think Tim can plead the unknowing useful idiot defense of this case because he seems pretty in on the game right here. It was a challenge by, by Infowars. Why do you think this is? It, it fits their agenda. Mm -hmm. You know, when I went to... And what do you think their agenda is? Their, their agenda is to make people scared of immigration and refugees. Hmm. So a bit later in a discussion on the rise of far-right media, John gives us this insight. But if you look at the stuff they do, that's actually taken from mainstream media. Many of these websites are not news outlets. They'll just collect news from serious news organizations and then add, like, this is how you should understand this. And that is just simply amazing! Because it's not only true, Tim would go on to do that for a career. Seriously, nobody does that more than Tim. Whatever. You know, it's almost as if Tim thought about what John said here and thought, hey, that sounds like a pretty good model to base my career on. But yeah, that's what Tim does for a living. Reads mainstream media articles and tells you how to feel about them. And now you've got this dude's, this family, saying they weren't fighting over a chicken sandwich, man. These people are hypocrites and they're disgusting. It's all been analyzed. Eight out of 10 are indeed mainstream sources. The exceptions being Breitbart and Andy No tweets. Hmm. Speaking of Andy No. In, in, the, in the US, there's been several high profile incidences where people faked hmm, hate attacks. And these stories are highlighted by these right wing sites and you know, media outlets as proof hmm. that these are fake hate crimes. We have these stories from both sides, and of course, that these things are used as propaganda, saying that, well, it wasn't true this time, and then understood is that it's not true in all these other instances as well. And, and that's a type of propaganda that's been around for a long time. Indeed it is, and Tim creates it. He's made 38 videos, I counted them, there's no duplicates here, on just the Jesse Smollett case alone. Contrast that with just one video he made on the white supremacy motivated Christchurch shooting, a video in which he claims to have read the shooter's manifesto. I've also looked through his manifesto. Titled The Great Replacement, yet somehow didn't know what that was afterwards. One video on Christchurch and two videos on the El Paso shooting, all three used to propagate his incessant warnings of civil war. 
we're in a civil war. We are in it. Fake hate crimes are just a fixture on his channel, but you know what isn't? Actual hate crimes. Although Tim does love to point to odd fringe cases like Pepe painted on Bernie's face and a dog. No, I'm sorry, another dog accused of a racist crime. All in all, it's pretty hard to make the case that Tim takes hate crime seriously and very easy to think that his videos would provoke one to say, well, it wasn't true this time, then it's not true in all these other instances as well. By the way, John did explain the Nazi roots of the Sweden Dem to Tim. Swing Democrats have roots in uh, fascism and Nazism. They actually have those roots. Um, they were founded by people who were veterans in the, the, the sort of the white nationalist scene. He also touched on their current dubious ties, as well as just how far right they still were, making Tim's lack of providing Chang with any questions whatsoever all the more journalistically irresponsible, which is honestly something I didn't even think was possible, and rendering bizarro statements like this. The, the Swedish Democrats are considered the far right, the alt-right of Sweden, but they are further left than the American left, which is hilarious. By the way, I have two other examples of him saying pretty much the same exact thing as that, and they're all either excessively dishonest or just superhumanly stupid. One of the two, or perhaps both, probably both. Now, this one is kind of sneaky. Once again, while discussing the rise of far-right media, Tim says this. The rise of these sites at least has something to do with the media's in a ineffectiveness at communicating towards these groups who are now seeking out the alternative. Would you, know, would you agree with that or what's your opinion? I would say that that's actually primarily a strategy from far-right extremists. Then there are people who are upset with reporting, but there are people who are upset with the reporting of mainstream media from many sites. With this surge of people saying that media cannot be trusted, media is lying about this stuff, that is actually primarily a very ideological and political uh, critique, which comes from a very clear political spectrum. So if there's one thing that Tim and his audience loves, it's a good scapegoat. Uh, another example would be how after Charlottesville, he pretty much blamed the SJWs for the rise of the alt-right. When the far left creates art installations that say, fuck, kill white people or fuck white people, when you have media organizations that are absolutely okay with shitting on people for being men or shitting on people for being white, you're making the far right recruit much more easily as well. So right here, he's essentially blaming the rise of Swedish xenophobes, Islamophobes, and neo-Nazis on the media not speaking to them. Oh, won't somebody please think of the- Neo-Nazis? Okay, so hear me out here. Instead of the scapegoat that Tim fashions from the SJWs and the media creating those that hate, maybe these people are hateful because many deeply insecure people and or those who are thoroughly dissatisfied with their own lives tend to need and develop hate-based scapegoats. Basic psychology. But anyhow, that's not why it's super sneaky. No, 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 no. Days after having this conversation, Tim would later use this explanation twice within his Sweden series. All of this is just making more people feel distrustful of the establishment. It is making the far right party, the Sweden Democrats, grow every single year. And amazingly, one of those times was literally in response to a journalist who is criticizing his journalism. And what do you think is gonna happen when the average person is sick and tired of reading a story about the journalists instead of reading a story about the issues their country is facing? It's gonna drive them to alternative media websites and then subsequently, far conservative parties. He's literally saying, hey, go ahead and talk about how irresponsibly pitiful my journalism is, but you're gonna create some Nazis. And you know what? That's not the only time he does that in the video. So that's a total of two times within that video and three times altogether. So just unreal, dude, Tim. What are you? Now, throughout his Sweden series, Tim gives the impression that there's an element of fear in the air due to repressive hate speech laws, that the press just can't truly express themselves, and free speech is under attack. And since his trip, he's been a little melodramatic about it. I've talked with people who have visited Sweden on vacation, and you know what they tell me? They tell me it's the North Korea of the North. 
Okay, maybe I added that last part to Mike Cernovich's documentary hoaxed, but anyhow, all of this manifests into this question. Right, in, in the United States, the extent of free speech is that you can't incite violence directly. But according to the law in Sweden, even expressing contempt can be a crime where you can be in prison for up to two years. Mm -hmm. It actually takes quite a lot for people to get, they have to be quite close to what is illegal in the United States. The tradition of how the law is interpreted it shows that it's actually not so easy so that you just express contempt. Yep, it's all true. Sweden does have some of the most lax speech laws in all of Europe. In certain regards, yes, US laws are less restrictive, but there's various metrics to assessing overall freedom of expression. And well, Sweden does rank number three in the 2020 World Press Freedom Index, while the US is uh, number 44. Hey, we beat Tonga. Ludicrous notions that Sweden is some kind of tyrannical free speech hellhole isn't just an ignorant lie, though. It furthers Tim's overall project of sealing his followers into a political and informational bubble. The left wants to take away your free speech. It's compelling your speech with malice speech manipulations, no less. But Tim is fighting to save it. That's a line in a movie they thought was appropriate to come out right now. Pull the movie. Seriously, I mean, look, man, I'm not saying the movie should be pulled necessarily. So remain inside the warm, gooey goodness of Tim's bubble, because the man is a free speech martyr. I mean, as Cernovich's documentary hoax also notes, which isn't really the case. He was just blocked on Twitter for one week by the official Twitter account of Sweet. They would change curators every week. That particular curator used a block list to block a bunch of people, but next week's curator just unblocked the ball and tweeted this out. So Tim's maybe being a tad melodramatic here. And by the way, Tim also obtained this information from Chang Frick, cause of course. But good thing he did because it allowed Cernovich's hoax, a documentary on media lies featuring paragons of truth like Stefan Molyneux, James O'Keefe, and Alex Jones, to continue to weave this myth of Tim being some sort of free speech hero. And speaking of Cernovich... Uh, one of the higher profile Trump supporters is this guy Mike Cernovich. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him at all. I've heard the name. He said that the Trump supporters are going to become more moderate. And so they've actually been reeling back trying to purge the racists out of the Trump supporting, you know, uh, base. And I had to point this out because, well, the individual Tim primarily is referring to here that was purged by Cernovich is Capitol Hill insurrectionist and alt-right rapper dork, Baked Alaska. And just a couple of months after his discussion here, Tim asked Baked Alaska this extremely hard-hitting question. So let's, let's cut to the chase and, and go straight for the political accusations. Yeah. Are the people coming here Nazis? No, <laughs> absolutely. White not. nationalists? Uh, I'm not a white nationalist. No follow up to that question. Come on, Tim, please just don't hit him too hard with the journalism for the love of God. And finally, possibly my favorite scapegoat slash false equivalency in the entire interview from Tim, uh, and really just try and follow him here because, well, uh, I just think this is kind of nuts. On the left, we had things like the hashtag, yes all men, mm. right, where feminists specifically said, you know, they made, they made this, uh, this old reference to, if you have a bowl of Skittles and one of them is poisoned, would you take a handful? And they put hashtag, yes all men. And they also have the hashtag kill all men. So they certainly do target men as a whole group because of the perceived, right? So people seem to be intolerant. Uh, I, I think. Okay, now that argument got so weird that it fucked the camera up. Uh, I googled the poisoned Skittles thing because that was just like, what? Uh, but funny enough, all I could find was a horribly cruel Donald Trump Jr. tweet about poisoned Skittles in reference to Syrian refugees. But never mind. Did you understand where he was going with that? At the end of Tim's creative little Skittles aneurysm, he says, so people seem to be intolerant because, and what he's basically saying there, and I will steal bad, 
kind of, is that one of the reasons we see people becoming increasingly intolerant is because of things like this cringy hashtag that probably mostly angsty teenage girls are tweeting a lot. I've decoded it, that's what it means. But fortunately, Lehman gets to the heart of and neutralizes Tim's very, very, very confusing and sad hashtag kill all men with the poison skittles is creating intolerance, and somehow that's all very important argument quite well here. So people seem to be intolerant. Uh, I, I think also that is a type of propaganda that sort of makes me sigh, but it's not connected with an actual political agenda to get rid of men from the United States. Whereas uh, this anti-Muslim positions, that's connected to an idea that Sweden has to be purged of these people. So I think, I, I don't think they compare. Yeah. Of course they don't. And first of all, yes, this was a frequent talking point of Tim's. These blue checked high profile feminists. And they say things like hashtag kill all men. You actually have feminists saying things like hashtag kill all men. Women use the hashtag kill all men. Yes, this is pervasive. It's just kind of a common reactionary false equivalency designed to assign false blame, to be honest. It's essentially the same tactic we saw in the Charlottesville clip earlier and that we can see on display right here. For, for me, seeing all of these men walk around with tiki torches, it really shouldn't be surprising to the media and to the left and all these people shocked. White men are kind of angry right now. It's everything telling you white men suck, white men suck. So it's kind of like you really didn't expect this. Yep, I guess MTV made a cringy video and we have this kind of cringy hashtag. So you really didn't expect this? Really? Uh, yeah, pretty much the exact same tactic. But as Lehman notes, there's just no genuine political mechanisms in place to purge, replace, or displace straight white men. There are with American immigrants, and with Muslims in Europe, and arguably America too. So the two simply do not compare. And unless Tim's beanie acts as some sort of information repellent, through this conversation, he should know that. But yeah, all in all, it's obvious why he never posted this. It's embarrassing, it made him look horrible by virtue of the fact it conflicted with so many of the narratives and tactics he utilized throughout the Sweden series and continues to employ to this day. The series itself is his most significant early showcase of his willingness to platform what would one day become a long line of political extremists, neo-fascists, crackpot QAnon, Pizzagate, and 9-11 conspiracy theorists, stop the stealers, all-out grifters, anti-vaxxers, and just plain cranks with little to zero pushback whatsoever. A practice that has worked out quite well for him, to be honest. I mean, it would in great part one day allow him to purchase his glorious skateboard park compound slash mansion where he's said to stockpile guns and has on occasion used it to harbor kidnapped cats. Yeah. Anyhow, the Lehman interview is a fascinating early look under the beanie and straight into the braid of Tim. And if that disembodied brain could somehow talk, I think I know what it might say. Welcome to Garbage World. So hey everybody, uh, this is a little unusual, I guess, but first I want to say that this video is dedicated to Laura Thornhill, a longtime patron and supporter of the channel. Although we never met, I wish we did. She was just exceedingly kind and just super fun to talk to over the years. And my heart both goes out to her family and her twin sister, Lena. So we're just gonna pour one out for my homie. There we go. So, closing thoughts. One, make no mistake, this was the series that truly launched Tim's YouTube career. And you can hear him acknowledging as much right here. I've, I've always produced videos on, on you, my YouTube channel, but it became a real consistent thing with Sweden. Two, don't give Tim any credit whatsoever for not posting the Sweden Democrats footage. He had every intention of doing so. We still have many more interviews from Sweden that we, we may put out soon. It's just an issue of translation for the most part. I know for a fact that was the only untranslated footage they ever shot, so yeah. Three, this is slightly unrelated, but 
oh boy, it's worth it. So in the last video, I demonstrated that Tim's perpetual claim that I voted for Obama, Obama to do it, which helps in giving him faux left-wing centricity cred, probably just isn't true in light of the fact that he revealed in a little known 2011 interview that he hadn't voted for Obama in 2008, he actually voted for Ron Paul. Wow. And I wanna just kind of poke a big hole into another one of his running probable lies. If you've ever watched him, chances are you know that he loves telling everyone how he supposedly grew up in the crime-ridden streets of Southside Chicago. I grew up on the South Side of Chicago. I'm from the South Side, man. So I grew up on the South Side. I grew up on the South Side of Chicago. I grew up on the South Side of Chicago. I have watched people do drugs. You know what happens on the South Side when you challenge their honor? Yeah, they get out with a gun, they come in with guns, and sometimes they just kill you. Uh, one dude in my neighborhood was made to kill people when he was a teenager. So the guy just went, pulled out a gun and went, pop, pop. That's Chicago. So unpacking the various motivations and many dishonest narratives that I think are at play here that Tim gets to spin by constantly reminding his viewers of this, well, that would be a video into itself. But again, I did have several former co-workers of Tim's contact me, and one did provide me with this very interesting bit of insight right here. Tim's whole south side shtick comes off like an act. He didn't even live in the neighborhoods that are considered most dangerous on the south and west sides of Chicago. When he talks about Chicago violence and other systemic issues, Tim acts like it's purely a cultural thing. He glosses over the cause and just draws attention to the effect. Even after talking to people with real experiences of urban violence issues, he still defaults to his cliche anecdotes when talking about it. You can still see the same pattern in what he does now. He ignores or removes context from the cause and puts puts the effect on blast. Mm. So yeah, that's how Tim lied his way to YouTube fame, uh, at least the abridged version. Now some final, 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 final thoughts in just a moment, but first, if you guys enjoyed this video, please do this, this, and this. That's all fantastic. And if you really, really, really enjoyed it and you'd like to support a creator who honestly is trying his best to get content out while dealing with a bit of health stuff, more on that in this video right here if you'd like. You could be super duper awesome and consider becoming a patron. You'll get updates, soundtracks, deleted scenes and outtakes of this video and more. Or make a one-time donation to my PayPal. We got t-shirts and other stuff, some pretty rad new designs, so check all of that down below. Huge thanks again to Amen Animations, by the way. He's nothing short of amazing. Lastly, since this word, and a bunch of others that YouTube's algorithm has a hard time with were inevitably uttered throughout this video, there's a decent chance it won't get monetized, which may hurl it into algorithm hell. Ah! <laughs> so to counter that, it would be incredibly helpful if you considered following me here on Twitter and not just like, but retweet the pinned comment on my feed, which features the video. Tim is just one of the largest political YouTubers and career liars on this platform. And I put as much blood, sweat, editing, and research tears into this as I did, cause well, I just, really want people to know about all of this. Oh, and check out Tim Pool Apocalypse the Lost Tim Pool tapes cuz that's a banger too. Psst. Hey Tim, this is for you. So, brief overview. In various videos now, I've shed light on how you help push a bogus news site that was in fact run by the Nexium cult. With barely seen footage that you deleted years ago, I demonstrated how you egregiously lied about not pushing Seth Rich conspiracy theories, which you did numerous times on multiple platforms, then threatened to sue journalists for stating the truth about it, and that you were successful in that, I might add, and that you were loving it. I republished long deleted footage of you saying all sorts of just bizarrely unfortunate things like this, for instance. What I will say about Richard Spencer is that uh, he's a nice person when you meet him and talk to him. That's really about it. 
I don't think he is a, a, a Nazi. No, boy! Uh, I, of course, also brought to light the Holocaust denying lunatics you platformed as just regular dudes, and how you even repeated some of their baseless bonkers conspiracies on the Roman Report long after knowing exactly who they were. I thoroughly debunked the primary lies behind the very incident that more than anything jump started your YouTube career. The article on how you kidnapped that cat? My paws were all over it! Yup, it was me that tipped off Will Summer, and yes, he said I could post this DM to brag about it. And now I'm doing it! Nearly three paragraphs of the devastating recent Daily Beast article by Robert Silverman contained information found in this video. I revealed how you gave your camera over to a man who has been paid by fascists to create fascist propaganda for those fascists at a Swedish fascist convention and then nixed the interview where you were specifically told that they were fascists and ex-fucking Nazis. And you know what? That is all a very incomplete overview. Tim, I'm just some random idiot on the internet. I'm the cat guy. Hey, it's Vadim, random idiot cat guy that's probably gonna be on my gravestone. And yet, it's undeniable. I have out-journalized you. That's right, I've out-journalized your entire career, which granted is a really, really, really low bar. God damn it, Tim. Look me in the eyes. Oh, oh, there he is. Oh no, what a fucking nightmare. You've been in the game over 10 years and you've been out-journalized by the cat guy. And you know what? It feels good. Don't try this at home, kids. I'm literally a professional. Who's your daddy, Tim? Who's your daddy? I am. Everything I've told you will be wrong and completely meaningless. So keep that in mind.